Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you wherever you are in the world. My name is Trisha Octaviano, and I'm from the Asia Euro Foundation based in Singapore. I manage the project ASEF Public Diplomacy Training. It is a project in partnership with the Diplo Foundation of Switzerland and is supported by the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs of Switzerland. Thank you so much for joining us. To begin, let me introduce the moderator of our panel. Our moderator is Mr. Lawrence Anderson, who is the uh, former ambassador of Singapore to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and non-resident ambassador to the Kingdom of Bahrain from March 2013 to September 2019. Um, Mr. Anderson currently is the director of the communications department of the Asia Euro Foundation. Lawrence, I give you the floor now. Thank you very much, Tricia. Hello and welcome to everyone to the second webinar in ACES Public Diplomacy Training Series on Lessons on Crisis Communication in the Internet Age. We started the webinar series with a session on cyber hygiene in virtual meetings. This has been recorded and still accessible on YouTube. Today, however, we will tackle how governments can effectively communicate with their citizens when face-to-face -face is no longer an option. Our speakers today will address the interconnection between official communications, audience interaction, and media dissemination in building an effective communications effort during a crisis. The key question is, how can governments work with various communication channels to ensure effective crisis communications? We are privileged to have three very knowledgeable speakers lined up for you this evening. First, Ms. Liz Galvez, Senior Lecturer, Fellow and Trainer with the Diplo Foundation. She was a Senior Diplomat with the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Liz will introduce us to government communication. Next, Dr. Mohammed Elmi Nekmat, Assistant Professor, Department of Communications and New Media from the National University of Singapore. Elmi will address government responses plus audience psychology and skepticism in mainstream media. And finally, Ms. Bren Robinson, Editor-at-Large, Nikkei Asian Review, Senior Fellow at the Institute of Security and International Studies at Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok specializing in Myanmar and the rest of the Southeast Asian region. Gwen will tell us more about the role and challenges of media in disseminating vital information. But before we start, we would like to invite all of you to take part in a simple poll. Now the question is, do you feel that people in your home country can easily find reliable information on coronavirus? Yes or no? The poll results will be announced after the speakers have made their, their presentations. So without further ado, can I invite Liz Galvez to provide general comments on government's communication efforts to the crisis. Liz? I would say um, that in general with crisis communications, governments have contingent, have pre preparations in place. They have contingency planning. The problem with this particular pandemic is that this crisis was completely unprecedented. I think it's fair to say that reaction from many governments was crisis, what crisis? There was, um, it was a knee-jerk reaction. Um, they, we heard the phrase, oh, they're just, just uh, another flu virus. We know about flu epidemics. We're in control, we know what to do. The problem was that this is completely different. And I think governments were not prepared at all um, for the, the, this particular crisis. So they have had to start from scratch in a way. I would say that um, the approaches basically have fallen into about three categories. In general, all um, governments want to show that they are in control and they know um, what they're doing. That's what their intention is with the public. 
that, um, but in this case, I think uh, there are three separate types of, of behavior, partly dictated by the culture and political system of the country. One is to say very little publicly about the causes and severity and the spread, or to downplay the crisis altogether and minimize the effect of it using maybe statistics which serve that purpose but not other statistics. Challenges from the public and the media might be either silenced altogether or ridiculed as we have seen in some countries. Um, another second approach is to give information that is necessary to tell the public what to do um, and what will happen if they don't obey the rules. Generally, I would say in those sort of situations, challenges from the media and the public are not expected and they're actually not really forthcoming. I'm, I'm happy to be contradicted on that, but that is my, my impression in, in, in some states. Now, the third approach, which is the approach that I would say holds in Europe, is to give the public as much information as they can digest about the disease, about countermeasures, in order to preempt questioning from the media and the public on every aspect of policy. Now, you might say that they're actually giving too much information and the questioning is still continuing, a lot of it very skeptical. So one must question whether that always works. But what they have done in these cases, government communication has been fronted by heads of government, um, and sometimes heads of state. They have gone live uh, um, on TV to actually broadcast to the nation to explain what is expected. Um, this is not something that is very common generally. Um, they want to show trustworthy leadership, I would say, is what they're trying to do here. They're mobilizing all channels of communication, including in some countries, influencers. And they've brought out scientists to talk about science and statistics, statisticians talk about the data. Um, the aim is trust and the uh, method is transparency. But I do think there are three areas where communication could be improved. First, there's a wide divergence of policies on controlling the virus. Now this puzzles people. Why, if the virus is global, isn't there a globally agreed strategy? How do you as a government inspire public confidence um, when your public notice that you aren't following the WHO advice or you're doing something differently from your neighboring country? I think countries haven't managed really, governments haven't managed really to explain that always to the public satisfaction. Um, secondly, there's no real clarity and consistency on data. Different countries are compiling data according to different methodologies. So it's difficult to compare your country's situation with another when it suits your country, suits your government to, when your statistics are more favorable then those statistics are quoted. When they're no longer favorable, of course, the statistics are hidden. But there is, um, there is a, a, I think, a lack of consistency about collection of data. I mean, we've all read the tweets that if we stopped testing, we'd have far fewer cases. But the public want accurate and up-to-date data because they need to know what they, need, what they have to do for their own health, and they need to know um, how to plan their lives, when they can go back to work, how they can get back to normal as soon as possible. Um, the third area, I think, which we will talk about later, is that information communicated by governments is somehow less believable than the fake news and theories that are, are spread on social media. I mean, even the most bizarre theories seem to have traction. Um, why? I'm not, we can discuss that later, but the governments need to examine how they can tackle this, this, this question effectively to stop this, this spread of fake news, which is destabilizing. Um, I just before I finish, I just want to mention one area which is quite often not mentioned, and I think it's relevant to a lot of diplomats who are working in embassies abroad. The efforts to keep nationals 
informed, your own nationals abroad informed, both about the situation in the host country and the situation in your home country. So that's a double effort of communication that a lot of consulates are having to do. And they're minimally staffed, they're working very long hours in difficult conditions, and yet they still are expected to produce this information regularly and up to date. Um, and this is something that many countries have managed to do successfully. Other countries may still be struggling a little bit for, for a variety of reasons, but this is also when you have thousands of, of uh, or maybe millions of, of nationals, whether it's expatriate workers, diaspora, long-standing diaspora, or tourists, these people also need to be informed as well as your own publics at home. So I'll finish there. Okay. Well, thank you, Liz, for your insightful presentation. Very good points. Now, let me turn over to Dr. Elmi Nekma to illustrate how the public usually behaves during times of crisis. Elmi? Okay. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, okay. So I'll sh I shall just go straight to my three points that I would like to share. So basically, um, to, to answer Lawrence's question, I have three points. The first point is the fact that crisis is or crises are always followed by periods of uncertainty. And that is a condition of crisis that's very much researched in crisis communications literature. Um, and my second point is then we have to understand the online information conditions that affects these periods of uncertainty faced by users or audiences of people in different countries, for instance. And my final point, and I will then elaborate on all these three points and make uh, the links and link them together. So my final point is then the flight to safety type of behavior or behavioral response to such uncertain conditions and as well as to the, uh, the information um, situation that users are actually facing in social media or in online kind of settings. So point one, crisis are actually, uh, crisis are more often than not always followed by periods of uncertainty. Basically humans have a tendency to search for explanations and the need to attribute responsibility for certain crises. This is not new. This, is, this happens to almost any crisis that, that are facing a society or that, are, that is facing a certain uh, group of people or organizations, for instance. Uh, so it's, not, it's nothing new. But this need or this search for un, uh, this uncertainty actually affects their social, emotional and social psychological needs, um, increasing anxiety, increasing fear, increasing stress, basically with the intent to just reduce the ambiguity of the events that surrounds. Now, this need actually heightens when um, this crisis imposes threats to health and personal lives. So we have a range of different types of crises, be it natural disasters, pan uh, epidemics, pandemics, and even just um, you know, industrial accidents kind of crisis, right? But nevertheless, the, uh, those crises that impose threats to health and personal lives are actually increasing this anxiety. And the second reason why humans get more anxious or seek for more news or to reduce this anxiety is when these crises are proximal to themselves and their loved ones. Like for instance, if it occurs in their own backyard or in their own country, so it increases this anxiety. Now, um, some crises are harder, um, impact humans harder because of the unique and unprecedented nature, such as what Elizabeth has just um, shared with us about this, uh, this current pandemic. Uh, but most other crises are relatively quick to close, right? Upon investigation, upon um, answers can be found and remedies can be found to, to alleviate the situation. But in certain crises that are unprecedented, such as the, the COVID-19 pandemic, Basically, it's harder to close. So the period of uncertainty and ambiguity is actually extended and prolonged, even up to now. We are not sure whether a second wave is coming. Uh, we're not sure whether opening up is the right, um, is the, is the right uh, way to move and, and so forth, right? Um, even from the onset, medical facts or medical research has, uh, is, on, uh, is, is, is contradicting when it comes to the use of masks, whether masks are actually essential mm -hmm. or not in order to protect. So basically, this, we have not gotten certain uh, very accurate information or any finalized information. So in the period of this extended ambiguity, uh, humans get anxious and humans then resort to, which I'm going to elaborate on my point number two, that will resort to fact-finding behaviors. So when humans try to find facts and practical information, rumors, misinformation, conspiracy theories have been shown in research to actually proliferate, right? 
So what about this online information condition that, that uh, complicates this matter? Is the fact that we know we we now know that you know there are, there's a deluge of information, um, and a recent writing which hasn't been published by Bergstrom and 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 his colleague, uh, which is going to be published in August 2020. I think we should all um, go and look up for that. Um, is the idea of insidious confusion? It's not a new idea, but in 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 relating to to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, he highlights the or they highlight the, the the situation of the infodemic which is the fact that this information on the coronavirus stemmed by this, this, this condition of uncertainty is mutating and spreading faster than the virus outbreak itself. Now, that is another condition or another pandemic, which is the infodemic that governments should actually be focusing on, apart from just, um, just the pandemic or the, the virus situation itself. And I will elaborate why, because it's about building public trust. It's about building um, you know, um, public trust and safeguarding the national or the nation um, itself. So this period, uh, this insidious confusion and coupled with a lot of other characteristics of social media and online communication, which I will not elaborate now because I only have like a couple of minutes, such as filter bubbles, echo chambers, polarization of, you know, opinions, essentially means that audiences tend to be exposed to two types of information. One is the information that relates to them. Basically, how are they exposed to such information? It's through their own behaviors as well as through algorithms, social media algorithms. And they are also exposed to information that relates to the people or the social networks that they choose to keep on social media. So basically, the information that they are given are uh, pushed to them, right? So this uh, complicates matter. And finally, if I would just touch on then how then do they react to this inform uh, to these conditions of uncertainty and such deluge uh, deluge of information and such insidious confusion going on? Um, they fly to safety. So what is this flight to safety? That's a, that's, a, that's a very famous saying that goes, a wealth of information actually brings a poverty of attention. So basically, how then do we cope with that? Um, one thing that research shows us is that humans undergo cognitive dissonance. Basically, when they are faced with a lot of information and information that are conflicting with one another, they retreat to their cocoon and try to find the most comfortable way of dealing with this information. So how then do they deal with this mentally taxing and uncomfortable situation. There are several ways, which I'm just going to end with just sharing three, three ways. Basically, primarily these three ways describe the use of heuristics. Basically, we all use mental shortcuts to actually evaluate information to see which information relates to, uh, is useful to us uh, and so forth. So the three particular indicators for these heuristics are source. So I think Elizabeth has actually kind of mentioned source. Uh, but in terms of research, so this source are uh, like most probably familiar and trusted sources, such as news, family members, and friends, especially experts. But then again, when we talk about experts as sources, we are faced with two types of experts, whether experts are, who are credential and experts mm. who are more, um, in other words, um, the term uh, that we have, uh, I mean, uh, scholars have coined are cognitive authorities, basically experts who have experienced it for themselves. So. So there are, you know, um, source is one of them. Credibility and popularity criteria when humans use heuristics or mental shortcuts such as the engagement, the extent of engagement with each piece of information or news such as like, love, angry, and so forth provides humans a shortcut into, to, in, to evaluate the credibility of that information. The shares and the comments uh, are example of credibility and popularity criteria. And the third but not last are people. So humans use people to actually evaluate information in that sense. So how do we understand people is through humans' way of uh, uh, assessing or perceiving what other people think of the particular issue and or information, right? So there are four, four examples that we can think about when we look at how humans evaluate people. A macro level is through public opinion polls and surveys. So what do this, you know, what do Singaporeans think about this? What do Americans think about this? What do people in certain countries think about this? And then they use it to evaluate information. Um, another level is the online and information chambers. What do the people that I keep in my internet overall on the aggregate feel about this issue or think about this information? And then there's this micro aspect. What do the people on social media commenting on this issue? How do they, uh, do they agree? Do they comment? Yeah. And finally, real life people whom we talk about. Um, in, uh, in person, our family members, uh, who, people who we meet to talk in person, our family members and our friends and so forth. Now, we know that in COVID-19, there's a lockdown. So we actually do not get a chance to actually talk in person. 
So basically, this exacerbates the online kind of conditions that you know that create or that any uh, that that people depend on to evaluate the information. So uh, I shall end with that. So something to carry on in our conversation later. Thanks, Lauren. Yes, thank you, Elmi. You have certainly given us a lot of food for thought, mm -hmm. and this is very important, especially for when we want to engage the public during a crisis. We need to take into account a lot of feelings that they are likely to face. So thank you very much for your very interesting observations. Next, let me hand over the floor to Ms. Gwen Robinson to present the role of mainstream media in disseminating factual news in the age of social media. Gwen? Thanks, Lawrence. And uh, similarly to Elmi, I, I think you might have to give me a reminder if I'm talking too much. Uh, I had a slightly longer presentation, so I'll try and edit myself as I go and highlight the most relevant points. I'd, I'd just like to start by saying that I really think the, the COVID crisis overall has really been probably the ultimate test for media and okay. government, as well as organisations, in particular though for governments in their relationship, not just with media, but with also how they approach information management and indeed the truth. How far do you go? How transparent to be? How much to free up non-traditional areas such as health experts in your government to to hold their own briefings you know how much do you centralize uh <coughs> information and uh and uh, um how, how briefings and things like that so we've seen a lot of different approaches in uh in by various governments we can go into that later um but i'd, I'd like to also say it i think it's expanded the role of media or in fact how media see their responsibilities mm -hmm. from mainly a focus on news and serving the public with news to um, even adding what you might call a slight public service aspect or disseminating vital information. Um, so for example, when it came to informing people of the spread of COVID or running these very detailed uh, tables and things, the media is more used to hunting a good story and is also used to looking for sensationalist angles or you know the sexy news angle and instead we have found ourselves you know trying to actually support government efforts and uh you know health organizations to curb the spread so i think that's that's actually a really new element it's not like trying to cover a war or or something like that um and i think we've also seen I'm the last person to defend the excesses of social media, but I think we've seen some great strengths as well as the pitfalls of social media. Um, strengths in terms of how rapid and uh, wide the coverage is on social media, which I think has brought that home. Particularly, you see in Thailand, for example, that the, Thai, the government has used LINE, the LINE application, for example, to spread word of applying for emergency funding things like that. These are very constructive uses of social media. So I don't think it's all bad, but of course, when it comes to what we're talking about partly today, the spread of fake news, propaganda, misinformation, these are all the old problems. And I think a lethal aspect that is a newer problem, although we've seen it before, is the rumors about COVID cures, which have seen people you know, poison themselves and you know, do all kinds of peculiar things because someone reads on social media about a cure. And, you know, that's that's always been the case about, you know, miracle cures on social media. But I think when it's a life and death thing with the COVID pandemic, that's been a very uh, dark side of social media. Um, broadly though, the heart, I think of our theme today is the issue of crisis communication um, for media and governments and how to relay and also possibly shape information in emergencies. A crisis per se generally means emergency and it's usually singular, so you kind of talk about a single event. But unlike almost any other crisis I've ever had experience of, COVID-19 has been a very protracted emergency that has, I think, outpaced most government's abilities to keep up with policy decisions and announcements so for crisis communications, as we all know, the critical elements are speed, but also in equal parts, credibility and accuracy. More specifically, a government or even any kind of institution organization 
must look honest and transparent. And such is the demand of, um, of the COVID crisis that the public has been looking for honesty and transparency. Uh, now, governments themselves need media to convey their messages, but they really must, I think, better tailor their content and format to specific audiences. So in terms of format or the medium, messages should be angled uh, specifically for, say, social media or print or electronic and on different levels. A message relayed through a national broadcast, a television broadcast, is different from an opinion piece or Facebook message or press statement. And, you know, any message needs to build credibility, trust. And I think this is all about looking open and it has to be said, admitting shortcomings. So I would, um, I would commend South Korea and Singapore, which initially enjoyed great accolades for their swift responses. But when things went wrong and they saw spikes in infections, they were the first to admit um, that you know, infections were, were rising again. And I think they earned uh, accolades on that. Um, so more broadly on fake news, I think this issue raised by other panelists um, and uh, on the impact of uh, social media, we have seen some of the worst examples, particularly I think in India where we saw rumors spreading and uh, angry mobs attacking medical teams because they'd read on social media that the medical teams were spreading the virus, not trying to help them. Uh, so I think uh, the challenge for governments is knowing where to go, what kind of media to go to. Um, we can see on in the media um, tremendous appetite now amongst the public for more and better information. And the proof of that is in soaring online readership of media sites like the Financial Times, the New York Times, and also sites that are not mainstream media, but medical uh, websites. You can see people just flocking to places they feel they can trust. and. Uh, I think uh, responding to that and helping drive up numbers, um, sites that are behind paywalls, such as the FT, which is reasonably expensive, have made instantly decided to make free their information and news related on COVID, which in turn created a uh, much more audience. Have I got any more time? I've got a few more points. Well, to can you just can you just wrap up quickly? Okay, so. Let me just address the issue of what all this might mean for the media per se, and why should uh, others care? Overall, I think it's essential to understand the changing dynamic of the media landscape as a result of COVID and these terrible commercial pressures that are now piling up, even on the large, rich, mainstream media, we're seeing advertising revenues collapse. Uh, that means, and we are seeing job losses really starting very heavily now. Uh, recently in Australia, we saw 150 newspapers closed and 1,500 journalists sacked. Um, this is an escalating trend and I can't see major advertising coming back anytime soon. This is leaving mainstream media very short of revenue. And while, you know, readership soars, that doesn't help revenue that much. Uh, and plus making free the, the important information, COVID related, as a public service, uh, kind of robs them of, of potential subscribers as well. But I can go into this and more issues about the media per se um, in subsequent discussions. So I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you for a stimulating and thought-provoking perspective, Gwen. I think for most of us, when we look at the media, we only see the articles that come out. But you have brought a lot of different other factors which are so important in terms of the media industry, both on mainstream media, social media, so yes, we will look forward to more comments um, later on. But now uh, <clears throat> we have the results of the poll conducted earlier. Tricia? Yes, um, let me share the results. So do you feel that people in your home country can easily yeah, find reliable information on coronavirus? Yes, 58% of our participants say yes to this question. Mm, thank okay. you. Thank you. So, well, most of you, I guess, marginally, most of you, 58% to 42, that's very close. Most of you feel that, um, that yes, you have re reliable information, 
uh, I think this is understandable since you all are government employees, or most of you are, so you can't say basically that your bosses are not doing a good job in sharing the reliable information. But frankly, this is a major challenge facing most governments in the age of the internet. Governments are hard-pressed to compete with the deluge of information, to use the term which uh, uh, Elmi was mentioning earlier. <clears throat> and that's really out in cyberspace. Yet the issues now are so much more complex that require interagency consultations and coordination, where time is at a premium. If you do it quick, you risk getting facts or policies wrong. You are late, be accused of hiding the truth things which are um, basically less have touched on. So either way, you're open to criticism, which is something our panelists will touch on in our next segment. And in this session, in this moderated uh, discussion, I will pose a question to each of our panelists. Starting with Liz, who will, give, will be given the opportunity to answer before I pose the next question to Elmi. And after Elmi gives us his reply, I will turn to Gwen for the final question. So Liz, many governments, many governments struggle to win the race in information dissemination. They have to deal with bureaucracies. They need to get accurate data and they compete against other sources of information. Quoting your recent article posted on Diplo Foundation's website, and I quote, COVID-19 is spreading faster than press offices can get their messages out, end quote. And to add to what you wrote, misinformation and rumors is also shared faster than official communication. So bearing all these considerations and other considerations, what can a government do to deliver <laughs> COVID-19 information in the age of the internet? Um. Well, first of all, I, I wrote that in April, so or early May, I think. So, in fact, situation has improved in a number of countries where the the virus does seem to be easing off. Although we were told in the UK last night that we can probably expect another another spike in the winter, so we might have to go back to to the beginning all over again. Um, I think. Um, First of all, it's important to differentiate between deliberate disinformation and the myths and rumors and fake news that um, are spread mostly um, on social media virally. I mean, clearly, when deliberate disinformation is disseminated, and there have been a number of situations, I won't go into them, but I'm sure everyone knows um, which, which um, stories I'm referring to. Um, these, these, uh, this disinformation is disseminated basically to erode trust and create tension within the society of another country. So there are probably political um, motivations for that. When it comes to the myths and the fake news and the conspiracy theories, I don't know how these start. I mean, I think psychologists would need to do some serious studying on why these start. I mean, some We've seen, for example, the one about COVID uh, um, being spread by 5G technology, which is, it, it persists, and it, it persists, it persists, and it persists. Why? I don't know, but this seems to be very popular. Um, they may be spread because people are not sure if it's true or not, and they might post, just in case it is true, I'm warning you to be careful because. So that may be uh, an unintentional spreading. Or it could be because there's a, a way, it's a way to generate revenue, or um, because there may be political comments that would influence the public debate, there might be a political agenda, or maybe simply they appeal to people's emotions, so they, they spread them. I, 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 there are various reasons, and I'm not a psychologist or an expert on, on that. But an MIT study in 2018 concluded that false news stories are 70% more likely to be retweeted than true stories. It takes true stories about six times as long to reach 1,500 people as it does for false stories to reach the same um, number of people. Um, when it comes to Twitter cascades or retweet chains, 
falsehoods reach a cascade depth of about um, of about 20 times faster than facts and falsehoods are retweeted by unique users more broadly than true statements at every depth of cascade now that was that this is a couple of years old this study but i mean that's 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 really quite quite worrying so what can governments do about that well uh, for, just to take the disinformation um, issue first i mean for example the european union has developed a, a disinformation strategy um, to combat disinformation through increased transparency and credibility um, they want to have more transparency as to the originators. This is, I think this is to do with automatic bots and things on social media that, or, or fake accounts. Um, they uh, have, have proposed that online platforms should take more resp responsibility for fact checking. And we've seen that this is, this is happening now, even with some very senior leaders. Um, they have created their own network of fact checkers, and obviously they are making more um, innovative use of technologies like AI. Now, this is—I think—they're focusing mainly on the deliberate disinformation that is that is coming. Maybe that they suspect is coming from other states. But as for the myths and rumours, I think um, the first thing that governments need to do really is to debunk the. The, the conspiracy theory or the myth as soon as they can and they they have preferably using those same platforms and channels that the myth has been spread on um, they could work with reputable media to um, to to ridicule the stories that are obviously fake um, and they could also I think they need to work with um, local government and other stakeholders, business and things like that, where there is particular stories circulating that are, affect different sectors. Um, for example, in the health sector, there may, there may be rumors that you can, if, you're, if COVID is, if you are asymptomatic with COVID, then you can't, you're not infectious. Therefore, it doesn't matter if you go out, if you break the rules. Well, that has just been proven by the scientists just to be wrong. So mm -hmm. you, you break that then to, to say this is not true. So do not believe it. I, this is what happened with the bleach story. Do not drink bleach, everyone that was told by the, by the doctors. Um, so you can bring in reputable people like that. I think they also need to change their style of communication. If it's a very formal bureaucratic style, um, if there are press releases or formal written uh, statements that are issued at press conferences, this is not very empathetic with the public. There has to be a way to make people pay more attention to what is coming out of a, out of a government from a government source. Um, than from other sources, so they need. I think they need to loosen up um, their style a, a bit. I think this was mentioned already by Omni. I think, um, and then I also think why not use? Yes, I was also just going to say that I think that they should make more use of influencers. Um, I think if you have uh, if you have um, people like you know footballers, for example, if you have them, they, they're on Twitter, a lot of actors, uh, social, uh, celebrities, they're on Twitter constantly, and they are far more followers than government ever would have. Use them, work with them to get messages out. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's something that not enough governments are doing, I think. Well, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. I am sure you will have lots of questions when we go into the breakout session on this. <laughs> yes. But now, Elmi, yes. can I pose you this question? You research extensively on media and the social psychological processes and effects of online communication on public opinion. Mm -hmm. So could you please share with us your research findings and insights on government's responses especially pertaining to rumours and misinformation during crises, in particular in line with the current COVID-19 pandemic. And also, could you share with us how people reacted to the information efforts of the government? Okay, um, thank you, Lawrence. Okay, 
So basically, just to answer your question and to basically uh, segue into the kind of the, the, the most current research that I've done, um, me and my, my colleagues and I have done from the Center for Trusted Internet and Community at the NUS. Basically, I'll just go straight into uh, our findings. Um, we, we started this research with a couple of assumptions, right? So the main, the, one of the main assumptions in this battle with COVID-19 and uh, is that it's internal trust is secondary to public trust in government. So we have this assumption that it's the government that people need to trust, that the nation needs to trust, and information comes second. And how can government facilitate, or basically how can government use the battle with information to increase the trust in the public on their handling of the uh, COVID-19 crisis? So that's one, uh, one assumption. The second assumption is as what um, Gwen and, uh, and, and previous studies have shown, is also the fact that people have now flight or go onto news media as a flight to safety. If there's a lot of information and we really need to know what to do, how to keep ourselves safe, the most practical thing, the most safest thing is to run to the news media that has very strong gatekeeping, mainstream media or legacy main news media such as um, those very traditional and very legacy kind of uh, news in, in, in Singapore, for instance, as well as in other countries. So these are the two assumptions. So what can we understand from the strategies that different governments have done in their battle with misinformation in order to raise public trust. So our argument is that if the governments were to show their seriousness in terms of battling misinformation or battling the pandemic cousin of COVID-19, which is the infodemic, there's a chance for them to raise public trust in governance. So basically then, how, what are the themes or strategies that is reflected from the mainstream news in three Asian countries? that we can take and learn in terms of how governments battle misinformation um, related to COVID-19. And basically, how do these strategies reflected in the mainstream media differ between the three countries? Now, why the three Asian countries? Uh, that's another question. So we picked it because we started this, um, this study based on um, a situation where these are the first three countries that were hit or that has handled the first wave of um, misinformation well, China, Singapore, and South Korea. So we want to know what, as, what had been done during those periods, basically from the period of, um, let me just go into the, the analysis. Yeah, so between the timeline between December 2019 to 29 February 2020, between these three months, how do the government show the people how they have actually um, battled misinformation? Because this is about building government trust, right? So it's about the narrative and not only the kind of, um, and in this narrative, also explaining and providing steps and practical solutions for the people to actually protect themselves against misinformation, All right? So um, basically, this is just uh, the methods, and I do not want to go into detail. Uh, but basically, we we drew, we extracted five thousand one hundred seventy three reports um, in the three countries, and we we break, basically just draw extracted news from Xinhua Daily and People's Daily in China, um, Chosun Ilbo and Hang Kyore in in from South Korea, Straits Times and Channel News Asia. But of course, there are certain uh, limitations. For example, there are certain countries such as South Korea that has a more partisan and kind of news media systems, but I will not elaborate on that. Perhaps you can discuss that on, um, uh, on another part. But basically what we want to do is to actually identify the salient the themes that have been reported to the media, uh, through the media by the government. Um, and we, we basically just to do that, we actually analyze the news report that actually focus on misinformation, fake news, conspiracy theories. Uh, so how do we get this in information report? We, we went through, we have research assistants to actually go through and read each and every one of the news to actually pull out and, and identify because we know the limitations with uh, big data analytics and, and so forth. So we try to be as, as uh, meticulous as possible. So in, in summary, this is like um, the, the basic um, point, um, everyone can see it. So basically we found five main themes or strategy. One is through the use of law and punishment. Second is through the use of correctional action and advisory to the news. One is through social responsibility and education. Third is science and rationality. And fifth is cross-country referencing. That governments tend to reference other country uh, attempt at handling misinformation or plight in handling misinformation and how they use it to actually convince or you know, educate the citizenry on how to actually battle misinformation. So these are the, the, the statistics that shows uh, uh, basically the, the the percentage of news that reports on these particular themes. So as we can see in Singapore, 
uh, most news report on correctional uh, action and advisory type of strategies. In China, most of the news report on law and punishment as ways to battle misinformation. And in South Korea, the highest use is through cross country referencing, where we find a lot of news in South Korea actually reflected on a lot of stories that are about other countries that are actually affected that are actually suffering from misinformation and how, uh, and how South Koreans can actually handle the situation. So um, this is basically, I have a few more deck of slides to actually go in, the, in, in depth, but I don't, yeah. Think, um, yeah. I don't think we have a lot of time. Yeah. yeah, so I'll just say law and punishment is one. Um, correctional ac action, I think law and, and law and punishment is straightforward. It's about using how many laws have been used and how many people will be, will be will, will found guilty of producing misinformation and punished and for. Correctional ad action and advisory is another. And South Korea is really high on this also. So basically a lot of FAQs are given through news medias. A lot of um, expert interviews are given through news medias, uh, through the news, the mainstream news. Social responsibility and education, how the governments are calling for people to actually play their part <coughs> to one another, that this is not the role of just the government. All of us have to actually uh, do a great service to other countrymen. And for example, in Singapore, schools roll out additional programs uh, in terms of education, so forth. Science and rationality is a, a unique aspect of the news media in China, where a lot of news in, in Xinhua Daily and People's Daily report about science and rationality as the most powerful weapon in the battle against misinformation. Um, particularly, is precision is the key in battling COVID-19, then rationality and, and, and is the key towards battling the information epidemic, which is the epidemic's cousin, and basically running with a lot of narratives saying that rumors end with the wise. And finally, cross-country referencing, which is basically largely done in South Korea. Um, so basically, it talks about tales of zombies being spread Singapore, to scientific evidence, which is very irrelevant to their, to their country, but it just uses the kind of news or the kind of misinformation that's being spread in the US, in other countries to actually show the extent. It's basically more of like a cross-country referencing to actually um, show how the government is going to handle this and how it is serious and how we should look at it seriously in our country, for instance. So that's about it. So these are just some salient points which we can, I can discuss further. But these are basically to sum it up. Um, let me just um, distract. Uh, give me a minute. Uh, to sum it up, these are how um, the kind of strategies that, on a national level, the governments in these three countries have used to actually battle misinformation, and also to build public trust. And we have recently shown that to a uh, adamant trust barometer that some countries, like for example Singapore, where citizens trust just two days ago, just published two days ago, citizen trust in public institutions and governments have actually relatively increased compared to the previous years. So I'm not saying that there is a correlation. Perhaps there's a correlation. I'm not saying there's a causality, but you know, uh, this might be one of the answers. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, Elmi. I certainly will look forward to reading your report in greater detail. And I'm sure for all the participants, we are sorry we don't have that much time for a lot of the speakers because they've got a lot of interesting things to say, but perhaps you could question them in greater detail during the breakout sessions. But let me now turn to Gwen um, with regard to the, uh, hear her comments on this question. Uh, Gwen, journalists are considered as gatekeepers of information. However, mainstream media has been accused of contributing to the tide of information that flood people and even to a certain extent, dissemination of false narratives, which was brought up earlier by you and other speakers. So the question is, can independent media continue its role as vanguards of truth? And how can media work with governments for the best interests of the people? Right. Well, thanks for that, Lawrence. And uh, I'm aware we're running, uh, we're running uh, uh, possibly over time, and I had thought maybe to keep this extremely short, uh, so basically these two main points, I think one thing uh, building on the point I made before, which is I think for one of these very rare occasions, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has, you know, really filled, I'm, I'm talking about mainstream and regular media with of, uh, perhaps more responsibility. So as I said, there's almost a public service element to some of what the mainstream media have been doing. Um, basic straight information that is for the public uh, public uh, benefit and also 
um, relaying statements from governments almost verbatim. I mean, never have I seen CNN or BBC just opening up their their um, broadcast to a very very long government br briefings. Uh, mm. Well, maybe in a, in a, some particular memorable cases, uh, but um, this has continued for a very long time. So. In a way, the, the mainstream media did acquire a public service dimension. I think that's about set to change in the post-COVID era, barring a second wave. And in Southeast Asia, we have barely had a first wave in a lot of countries. So um, there is a sense that we are in the post-COVID era. And I can already see that the role uh, of a lot of mainstream media before trying to be responsible and perhaps help the government convey messages is turning more from a um, a watchdog into an attack dog. Uh, you know, for example, the debates about massive stimulus spending that governments are implementing now. I can see a lot more critical uh, media coverage of what should be spent where um, what has fallen between the cracks, the potential for corruption, demands for accountability and transparency. That wasn't happening earlier on at the peak of the crisis. Um, so I think there's in some senses a, a normalization which makes media possibly less of a responsible friend to governments conveying their messages and more of a, of, as I said, a, well, not a tack dog, but, but you know, real watchdog uh, guardians trying to pick up on discrepancies or potential, you know, corruption or demanding accountability and above all transparency. So that kind of shifts the relationship. Uh, and I think we'll see more of that on the role of independent media. As I, I did point out the uh, economic hardships uh, growing. I think this is just the beginning of what we're going to see in terms of um, collapsing ad revenues as you know, losses at major companies around the world that are big advertisers uh, accumulate and also <laughs> mainstream media that has made revenues from you know, big events like uh, big conferences and uh, things like that. Uh, most of that has, uh, has gone out the window and they're trying to make you know, some sort of alternative arrangements on live streaming events and webinars, but uh, there is no way that's going to make the kind of money for mainstream media that it made before. So I think what is, there'll be a lot of pressure on mainstream media on cost, but what we are seeing at the same time is a new proliferation, I think, uh, and I've seen it in, in Asia here a lot of um, small independent publications. Uh, I'm talking about mainly, well, nearly all online as far as I know, and there are plenty of examples. Sitting here in Thailand, we've seen two uh, online, what they call, you know, newspapers or media sites um, uh, that were born last year really do well in the COVID period because they are lean, they have a lot of young journalists, they are very social media friendly, everything is online and um, run by young people. So there's one here called the Thai Inquirer, which is very impressive. I've seen also other independent operations start up in the Philippines, in Indonesia, so uh, not necessarily in English. And I noticed there was a question about the language issue, which we might address later in maybe in my breakout session. But uh, so I think that in a way, this rise of social media and the, the demands of COVID, uh, including for rapid uh, information relay and rapid responses, so it's heightened the role of social media and digital media, and that has played into the smaller independent to find it uh, much easier, I think, now to set up a lean, mean little operation just with some good journalists and uh, their computers and access to the internet. And uh, in fact, you know, the, the quality ones, I think, will, um, will uh, persist and possibly expand their role. So maybe that's a that's a positive, um, and on the negative side, uh, you know, there'll probably more be more of the what we've seen of the you know the fake news, the propaganda, misinformation, and you know, least of it. I mean, most of it, I think, or at least a significant part of it, coming out of 
the mouths of leaders, for example, you know, watching America and some of the, uh, the political leaders there, uh, you know, their words are relayed on, on social media and, and reported by mainstream media. So that's another issue altogether, I think. But uh, uh, I just uh, will rest my points there and maybe go into some of this in the, in the breakout session. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, Gwen, I think you raised a lot of very pertinent questions. They will, I'm sure you will get a lot of questions in there. I think the one of the difficulties we have with you know media being the watchdogs or the purveyors of truth is that uh, when we deal with COVID-19, when you look even at what the experts say, what is the truth? One minute that something is, um, for example, the question of wearing of masks, for example, on on various issues, because it's such an uh, evolving issue. There's the question of virus mutation also, and there's also questions of prejudices. You can put the truth there, but a lot of people, if they have a fixed mindset on something, it will, uh, it's very hard to change. So there are lots of various, various issues that are being thrown up. I wish we had a lot more time to, to discuss it, but perhaps uh, you, a lot of the participants, I'm sure, will be able to ask you a lot more questions during the breakout session, from which uh, uh, we'll give, so we will now approach the breakout session. Um, our ASAF staff will moderate these sessions. So my point to the participants is please prepare your questions for the speakers as we begin the move right now. Okay, well, welcome back everyone. I hope you had an engaging session uh, in the breakout. But so now may I invite each of the speakers to summarize how their respective sessions Starting with Liz, then Elmi, and then Gwen, to wrap up. Uh, thank you. Well, we covered about two or three different areas. One was the impact of the pandemic on crisis communications in the internet age. Um, it was mostly me doing the talking, so whether it's just, I'm just summarizing myself really. But basically, um, the, we would not have been able to have this kind of global communication without the internet, that's for sure. That we've we've had we've got all the advantages of fast speedy transmission of information which 25 years ago we wouldn't have been able to use um, and governments need to be using using that there may be some governments that are not doing it as frequently as others but for sure um, there needs to be um, they need to make the most of, of the of the technology that's available to, to get the information out quickly um, the, there was a question um, about social media offices in, in, I assume, in embassies and how, how they should organize their strategies. Well, again, they, have, they don't have to originate a huge amount of information themselves, they, but they need to be monitoring what's coming from their capitals and they need to be monitoring what's going on in their, in their um in their host countries and they need to get that information out. So they need to have some kind of system for monitoring and producing information so that it's, it's always up to date so that people always know that whatever is on their Facebook page um, is, is up to date. And, and that's going to be a fairly long-term um, effort I think as, as with all communications with to do with um, this virus this is not something that's going to blow over and they need to be prepared especially if it's if the situation gets worse again anywhere and the other question was to do with um, um, uh, well it, it essentially um, channels of communication and I think that there are a number of countries where you cannot rely on internet or social media to get your message out simply because of the digital divide. And I think governments in those situations need to fall back on the more traditional methods of communication. Uh, it could be newspapers or local newspapers, um, it could be radio, radio is probably um, more widespread. You could use local government to help you spread information, community leaders, Maybe I didn't mention this, but it occurs to me faith leaders as well um, can be helpful in, in telling their communities um, what the situation is. And I think in many parts of the world, we underestimate those of us who are used to using um, 
the technology where it's easy for us. We just send an email. We, we, we put something on Twitter. We have a post on Facebook. We don't think about it. We put information on the website. People click on and search. But there are a lot of places in the world where that simply is not possible. Um, but that's not a problem that can be solved um, in, in, the, in the next six months. But certainly those organizations that deal with correcting the digital divide probably need to get to move on, actually. And there needs to be much greater progress more quickly. Yeah. yeah. I think okay. that's Simon will correct me if I've missed anything. <laughs> well, thank you, Liz. Perhaps now, Elmi, could you summarize what the discussion in your group? Okay, um, quickly, uh, we had four questions. Uh, basically, the first question is like what is similar. Similarly, how do we bridge the digital divide and how can this digital divide be inclusive in terms of communities and how different communities can actually, how can we create the information infrastructure where communities actually uh, are able to train and develop capabilities to fight misinformation. So briefly, um, the ideas behind that is that perhaps we can look at communities of interest uh, instead of breaking communities in terms of uh, their demographics, we can look in terms of their, their interests, be it in climate change, be, be it in environmental communication, be it in business communities, be, be it in cultural communities. So we look at cultural, uh, we can look at communi uh, communities from these aspects and then government interventions can then come in from this angle, right? Um, the, other, the other question that we looked at is basic, uh, basically how then do we, what's the, how would you suggest for countries to actually best fight misinformation. So again, this type of questions or this, this sort of questions have no one answer fits all. So it's across a broad spectrum. Of course, uh, we spoke about briefly on the fact that there are many options. Laws and punishment is one of them and has been shown by some countries and it's been increasing in some countries. It's, nev it's nevertheless, um, it's, um, it's arguable. It's very, uh, it, it doesn't fit into all countries, but it is, um, and then of course, many other ways um, of um, battle against misinformation that basically we sum it up according to context and country uh, and countries and cultural and you know, political differences right so there is no again one 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 size fits all kind of solution um, and you know um, and finally i think we spoke about the role of language i think um Kirst, uh, kirsty bowers raised that question how can we understand um language what are the implications of language for misinformation Personally, I find that a very fascinating question because uh, pers uh, from my research perspective, I'm also starting to look at how language affects trans boundaries uh, flow of misinformation. For example, um, in Singapore, if I were to give an example in Singapore, context where we have multi-racial, multi-language, multi-cultural society, um, if information or misinformation in a particular language or dialect, such as um, the Chinese or the Hokkien dialect and the Chinese language, flows from China or from Taiwan or from Hong Kong, from you know, our neighboring countries into Singapore, what is the effects it has on Singapore's local population? Does language um, influences um, the believability and the sharing of this kind of information, the influence of certain misinformation? And if it does, then I think it has a more global transboundary effects, implications that we should consider, considering that, you know, we are being um, considering two factors. One is that um, we are we are now starting to re-question or starting to question the language imperialism or the English language that is embedded in social technologies such as social media, bringing up a whole set of questions in terms of cultural and language. Second, we are also questioning in terms of you know how societies are fractured in terms of language and culture across different countries. So I think from a social, psychological, cultural, and social political kind of perspective, I think the role of language in misinformation is uh, something interesting that we talked about in that, uh, in that discussion. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Elmi. Uh, sounds interesting indeed. So Gwen, what about you? How did your session go? Yeah, no, it was uh, wide ranging actually. Um, so I'll just pick a few highlight questions, perhaps. Um, um, one was particularly interesting, uh, the, the role of, uh, you know, how the role of, of media for governments uh, uh, could change. And in fact, uh, it, I'm glad it came up because it helped me make a point uh, about, uh, building on an earlier thing I said about the shift 
I think the fundamental shift in the media mindset from now on in the post, what's seen in Southeast Asia as post COVID era, at least the sense in countries like Thailand, where it's been, um, it's been a very successful uh, management of the uh, pandemic situation. So I think, you know, as I said, I think you can already see the media in Thailand moving from being more like almost a bit public service and, you know, running these long announcements by the government or, you know, 40 minutes of government briefings uh, turning more into uh, something of a, of a watchdog role as the government here debates the huge uh, stimulus or emergency spending, how it's going to be spent, um, lots of concern raised in the media about potential for corruption on, on this, you know, massive amounts that are going to be released into the community. I can see the same thing in Indonesia, monitor, having monitored the media there, the obsessions with the impact uh, of more debt that Indonesia is taking on how they'll spend it. Um, so I think the media will increasingly probably take a more critical stance at post-COVID reconstruction, um, you know, uh, measures and uh, assistance uh, programs, uh, both on the funding issue and also content. Uh, that kind of slightly shifts the, the media role, I think. Um, another question was about uh, whether we will see a rise of more community-based media, uh, partly as a result of COVID, and also I think some of the trends I talked about. And just to reiterate, we're seeing, you know, huge pressures on mainstream quality media and at the same time the rise of sort of leaner independent media i'm i didn't get to say before but i think uh community media is going to is coming into its own already but particularly in places like australia where i mentioned we saw uh, the the announcement of the closure of 150 newspapers in one week uh last month that actually is mainly very small local papers and there's no way a local community wants to do without uh, its local media, which is very much local. I think the, the way is hugely open for, uh, you know, a young group of enterprising journalists, maybe if it takes a few journalists and laptops and uh, low budgets, and they're catering to a local community with a local community focus. So I think my prediction is we'll see a lot more of that kind of localized reporting. Also, let's face it, with you know the travel restrictions likely to stay on for, for quite a long time, particularly in countries that are not in any of these travel bubbles, I think the concerns generally of public and the issues are going to be much more localised rather than caring so much what happens you know, on the other side of the world. I think people will want to know much more about you know, potential for infections or how you know things are going uh, in their local communities uh, very very much concern on and things like that of infections so um, that that's that actually it's one of the maybe bright spots uh, for media in this in this period is uh, local media being empowered um, another question was about whether governments uh, their relationship to social media and whether it will change as a result and I think I, I did mention before, you can see in Thailand, for example, the, the government here using the LINE application, which is extremely popular in Thailand, less so in other parts of Southeast Asia, very popular in Japan and South Korea. But um, here, I mean, to apply for emergency uh, funding if you've lost your job, some of the platform is specifically online and requires you to use LINE. So I think in some ways, inadvertently, the government has kind of bolstered um, some of the social media by using it and making available certain channels for assistance through social media. And um, they've also, I noticed right through the region, actually, you know, governments are beginning to get wise to using social media more effectively. And particularly, I did mention that I noticed Platforms like Twitter, for example, is ad, has added a dimension where you can run 10 minute videos up to 10 minutes off Twitter. And I think, you know, you might see more uh, organizations, possibly governments using that function to um, stream um, statements and things like that. So 
I think I'll just uh, leave it at that. They were some of the key questions. Sorry if I've missed any, and if Yulia is there, she might remind me if there's anything else I haven't covered, but I think we're running way over time, so I'll stop. Well, your session seems to be pretty interesting because, you know, I think you've raised up a lot of trends and new channels that I wouldn't say actually happened after COVID. Actually, a lot of these things were there even before COVID. What right. COVID has done is probably accelerated the development of certain things. And, and it'd be interesting to see in the post-COVID world, when we go back to having normal functions, how much of these things will still be around. But yeah. clearly... What governments have to do is have to, we governments basically have to learn to be more nimble in how we respond to all these things and taking into account what Liz has said, bearing in mind also Elmi's points about the psychological aspect and how we want to address to the different audiences we, we tackle, not only during times of crisis, but even in normal times where we are having a population that is increasingly demanding for, for the truth and what is good news so and then how do you adjust to social social media and mainstream media having the uh, the, the many problems that you that um, you all have actually touched upon so i'm sure these are the thoughts also of um, quite a few of the participants and now we come to this um, um question and answer session which should we should um, see some interesting things being put forward to you but that would be handled uh, by trisha uh, who will summarize the comments and questions that are coming in before directing them to um, to each of the speakers to answer. Mm -hmm. So, Tricia, over to you. Thank you, Lawrence. Some of the questions that were raised have already been answered during the breakout sessions. And since we are pressed for time, I am just going to ask one question that is directed to each of our panelists. So first question is from Gunnar Mosor. Um, this goes to Liz. <laughs> yeah. what, what can you recommend to governments when they handle simultaneous crisis, yeah. such as in the case of the U.S. now, which is both dealing with COVID and racial riots? How do they ensure that the flow of information in one crisis is not ignored over the other? Okay, and then next question is for Elmi. Is there a possibility of information fatigue? How could we possibly counter that? And last goes to Gwen. And the person says, I have a simple question. How do government balance between communicating their policy and battling misinformation and disinformation at the same time? We know with the crisis, policy is updated even on a daily basis. Public can access digital information, but only for those who have access to it. When they do have access, the information might not be updated or even false information. So I first, um, yes, Liz? Uh, um. Well, you have a good question. Thank you very much. Um, of course, we have a lot of race protests in this country as well as not just in the United States. So we have the Black Lives Matter protesters who have been congregating at weekends regularly. We've had statues toppled. Um, the media, of course, is stuck between what do they want to report mostly on the inadequacies of the government in dealing with the virus or the inadequacies of the government in dealing with the race issues. Um, I think, I, I don't see that there's a, there's, there's a competition here. I mean, clearly you have to continue with your normal communication efforts as to what you're doing um, to, to control the virus, including, by the way, which I wanted to mention before, what your exit strategy is in the long term, particularly on the economic front, because now that people are not getting sick, they're now worried about whether they've got a job to go back to. So those things need to be addressed. As for the race riots, um, historically, this is going to be a difficult issue for politically for, for a number, a number of countries, um, but they do have to take account of the concerns of those people who have protested to the extent that you have thousands of people breaking lockdown at any one time. Some people don't like that. There have been criticisms of that, but that in itself detracts 
from the fact that there are inadequacies in social and economic support for a number of communities. Um, the black community feels that it is the most um, um, vulnerable um, in, in that sense, and that there is there is more much more that needs to be done there. You this is a this is a you cannot stop things happening in your country simply because you have this crisis. So you're going to have to tackle ongoing issues that that come up, and you have to reassure those communities that you're going to that you're still going to do something. I'll I'll stop there. I'll go, otherwise I'll speak too long. Okay, um, so I'll just um, carry on. Um, so the question is, is that information fatigue? Yes, I'm sure and I'm confident that all of us are basically suffering from this, um, in this state of constant bombard of information, especially when we are all locked down. I mean, for most of us who are locked down, basically we're just exposed to the online, whether it's social media or whether it's any form of site or any other site. We just have so much information. Um, well, to, to, to put some thoughts into it, um, basically there are a couple of ways which we humans have been shown to actually cope with this information fatigue, which is otherwise known as the information overload in their mind. Uh, basically, we humans are found to compartmentalize. So what we see in, term, in, in terms of our social media usage or information from online, we have started and I think social media companies have also uh, reacted to this is that we have different platforms for different purposes like TikTok for short videos and you know, um, Instagram for more hobbies and lifestyle kind of creation, Facebook for more mm. news and everything. So that's one uh, aspect. I think when it comes to government communications, government then just have to know that there are different platforms online um, in social media that targets based on certain information compartmentalized according to users. So they have to um, tailor their information in specific ways. To, to alleviate or not to, to, to connect in terms of humans um, way to actually uh, humans th uh, attempt to actually cope with information uh, overload. And the other, uh, the other aspect of information overload, which humans have been shown to actually, and I have actually kind of briefly discussed is the use of shortcuts is the use of mental heuristics. In other words, we tend to, you know, just move on and like, and, you know, do very, very much habitual kind of, um, uh, movement and information reading only to pick up on certain aspects, certain criteria of uh, certain characteristics within the content itself. Um, I think if we were to actually utilize such um, strategies of human information evaluation, um, governments can actually create strategies or create, um, like for example, I think most governments are actually using the use of nudges, right? How do you create nudge architecture in messages in government communications to actually nudge users to actually behave or like fact checking like fact checks are example of uh, information nudges where humans are uh, where, where you know where governments or third-party organizations used to nudge humans from stopping their uh, to, to put a break onto their very automatic information you know way of doing things so we can also consider all those kind of strategies so in short yes we are all information overloaded especially those who are actually very exposed to social media, but we, sh we mustn't dis disregard that those who do not have access to information and social media to begin with, um, then they will have ex different experiences, right? So I'm, I'm talking on behalf of those who are actually exposed to a lot of online um, content. And, and you know, by knowing how humans react, um, government communications can actually implement certain strategies or more specific tactics to actually um, um, you know, create strategies. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Elmi. And yes, Gwen. Okay, and I'll have to make this my last because I actually have to go. But uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Just remind me, it was uh, it was about social media and governments, but uh, also, yeah. could you just read that again? Okay, I'll read it again. How do government balance between communicating their policy and battling misinformation and disinformation at the same time? We know with the crisis. Policy is updated even on a daily basis. Public can access digital information, but only for those who have access to it. When they do have access, the information might not be updated or even false information. Right. 
yeah, thank you. It was the last bit that, uh, you know, there's a very simple answer about governments and social, you know, how do they battle fake information is partly to make sure that, you know, we've seen quite a little bit of, uh, you know, being very economical with the truth in some governments in this region, not particularly transparent. So the, the first thing to combat and, uh, and strengthen, uh, you know, reliability, their own reliability is to make sure the information they do give on social media is rapid and accurate. And uh, I think uh, that, you know, it's not just up to uh, the social media themselves and uh, the uh, general public to police social media, but governments themselves, I think, have to set the example of, you know, really, using social media to, to be transparent and honest. And once they're seen to be transparent and honest, people do tend to trust them more. But the more important question, and I'm really glad this was asked, was, you know, in this age of social media, and we've been talking again and again about how much, you know, social media has come to the fore, particularly in COVID. The ones who are excluded from that, for example, who do not have mobile phones, are illiterate, or whatever, I was going to say, we are in a region, and I, I, I know in some other parts of Southeast Asia where radio is still incredibly powerful. And I think maybe those of us in mainstream media tend to overlook the power of radio. It tends to be grassroots. Uh, it's listened to by a lot of people who can't afford TVs or, or smart mobile phones. And um, I think the government is quite, here anyway, I think the government uses it uh, quite effectively, or at least let's say parties that are in power. And I think also the Philippines and other places, but in more advanced countries, the power of the kind of more traditional or old fashioned media like radio is a bit overlooked. And also, of course, there is good old fashioned newsprint, but again, you know, given the constraints on, on movement and, uh, um, you know, like as in social distancing, I think uh, the, uh, actual use of newspaper, dead wood, is uh, declining as well. So um, that does bring these issues to the fore. And I would say again, my point about community media as well. I think these small little local, not necessarily on the internet, they, some of them are producing little newsletters. So, you know, that also is very important. I think there are many, many aspects we should look at more in with new eyes about uh, in this uh, post-COVID era. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, Lawrence, so it's time to wrap up. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Trish. Uh, this brings us to the end of our session and a warm thank you to everyone for joining us today. I'd like to thank in particular our speakers, Liz Galvez, Elmi Nekmat and Gwen Robinson for sharing your insights and advice. I certainly benefited from a lot of what you said, but I hope all our participants found it useful in learning how to manage and effectively communicate your key messages in crisis situations. Um, before you sign out, do keep an eye out for our upcoming online events by checking the ASAP website and following us on social media. I also now want to make a shameless plug for one event in particular. ASAP will do a webinar with one of Singapore's most distinguished ambassadors, Professor Tommy Ko. Ambassador Ko was also ASF's first executive director, and I will be asking him to share his insights on Asia-Europe relations. So if you are interested, please sign up quickly because slots are filling up fast. The Tommy Ko interview will take place on Thursday, 16 July at 5 p.m. Singapore time. So till then, stay safe and have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank you for joining. Okay.